Welcome to the Rector's Forum. Uh, my name is Mike Kinman. My pronouns are he, him. I'm the rector here at All Saints Church. Uh, it is wonderful to have you here. Great having you all here in uh, Pasadena with us and all again those streaming. Uh, just a couple uh, details. If you're new or visiting us uh, this morning, we'd love to learn more about you. We have uh, green contact sheets uh, by the doors. Make sure you fill those out. Just give us your name and contact information and then we can be in touch with you and be in conversation about how you might be drawn more deeply into the life and ministry of All Saints Church. We always put our faith into action here at All Saints Church. It is just a part of who we are. Uh, each week we pick one thing uh, to do, and this week we're asking everyone to write a letter to the Social Security Administration. Actually, we've written the letter. All you got to do is sign your name. Uh, opposing a proposed rule change that would make sweeping changes to the Social Security Administration's continuing disability review process. Um, this rule change would place a really onerous burden on about 4.4 million people already too heavily burdened with hardship. And um, many commentators have pointed out that a compelling reason to make these changes has not yet been demonstrated, um, except really the reason that it looks like that it's trying to be done is to make up for the deficit caused by the tax cuts passed in 2017. Uh, and to balance that on the backs of some of the people who can least afford to pay it. So please stop by the action table uh, near the door to sign this letter. Um, it is your generosity, it is your presence, it is the presence of the Holy Spirit that makes all the difference here at All Saints Church. Uh, and if you have pledged for 2020, if you were at the 9 o'clock service, we all went and laid uh, our gifts on the table, and we're going to do that again at 11.15 and, and at 1 o'clock. Uh, thank you, thank you for your generosity. If you have not pledged yet, you'll have a chance to do that again at 11.15 and 1. Uh, please pledge for 2020. Um, it does help us keep the lights on and keep the ministry going. Uh, it also helps you know that you got skin in the game for what we're doing here at All Saints Church. Uh, and that's incredibly important. And for those of you streaming online, it's super easy. There's a button right below my face right now that says donate. It's a big red button. All you got to do is click on it, and then you can fill out a pledge card. You can make a one-time gift uh, to give thanks for all that God is doing in your life and to support the mission and ministry of All Saints Church. Um, and now the fun begins. Um, <laughs> It is such an honor and a pleasure to have uh, Bishop Jennifer Baskerville Burroughs uh, with us. Um, sort of the headline when you get introduced was in 2016, you were elected Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Indianapolis, the first African American woman to be elected uh, a diocesan bishop. Um, before that, you had what I thought was the, actually an even cooler job title is you were the director of networking for the Diocese of Chicago, and that's because you had a really forward-thinking bishop, uh, Bishop Jeff Lee, who saw that what was happening in the diocese is people were connecting with a central office but not with each other. And so he called you there and said, I want you to go out and get to know everyone and then help them connect with each other and really build a web of relationship. Um, but mostly, it's just been, this is just fun, because we've known each other, as you said, for like 25 years. 25 years. Um, we were both seminarians at different seminaries when we met, and we were representatives for what used to be called the Presiding Bishops Fund for World Relief, is now called Episcopal Relief and Development. Um, and we've had a lot of fun in 25 years. And it just is, um, you are also one of the most faithful, visionary people that I know, and I just, every day I'm grateful that you're part of the church. And so can we first of all just welcome uh, Bishop Jennifer Baskerville Burroughs. So uh, what we're starting to talk about here at All Saints Church is um, a learning journey that we're going on. Um, we've spent the last year looking at what our values are, and our values we've realized have always been radical inclusion, courageous justice, joyful spirituality, ethical stewardship. Um, and then we said, well, what does it mean to put those into something that was more poetic, uh, a mission statement that says, this is what this looks like now. And so we talk about we're an Episcopal church walking with a revolutionary Jesus, loving without judgment, doing justice courageously, embracing life joyfully, reverently inviting all faiths and peoples into relationship for the transformation and healing of ourselves, our community, and the world. Um, and now we're saying, okay, that sounds great, and that really is who we are, 
Um, but what does that mean tangibly? What does it mean to live that out? What are our vision? What are our plans? What are our goals going to be to live that out, not just in the world that is, but the world that is becoming? And so we're going to be spending a good part of this year looking at the changes that are happening in the world with uh, environment and how we're uh, interfacing with the natural world and climate change and changes in self-determination and relationships and economic security and human development and well-being and uh, how all these things are changing um, so that we can be prepared to be, to do amazing mission and ministry not in 1998, but in 2020 and 2028 and in 2038. And I know that you've been working on the same thing um, as a diocesan bishop. Um, and so where I want to start is something that you touched on in your sermon, which is you talked about part of our challenge and opportunity right now is to do the hard work of hope. Um, and I'd love you to sort of, can you tell a story that really kind of encapsulates you know, what you mean by uh, us to do the hard work of hope. Absolutely. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. And one of the things I would like to preface is to say that when I say that All Saints has been inspiring me for a long time, I mean, it's the kind of, I would go to your website when I was a rector in Syracuse and download things and go, this is what we need to be doing here, <laughs> kinds of inspi inspiring. And so thank you for the ways in which you have informed the ministry that I've been able to do across the church over a long time. So the hard work of hope, Darren Walker, who is the president of the Ford Foundation, gave that term, so I want to give him due credit. But, it, you know, it's the, I read this piece and it won't, and it still won't let me go. And so what is the hard work of hope? And I, if I was going to tell a story about it, I would share about a congregation that, I mean, I love all my congregations in the Diocese of Indianapolis, but so, because uh, exactly, <laughs> but but this church um, in a town like many places around the Midwest, where the industry has largely left and people are hurting in a hard way, and I'm this what I'm about to tell you happened when I was brand new as bishop. I had been bishop for two months, and I did these listening sessions around the diocese to say, tell us, tell me who you are. What is our work together? Help me understand if we're moving together in the in the same way as I thought. I, I needed to hear it from the people. And so a lot of our congregations, like here, probably do amazing ministries in their community. This church f has maybe 35 to 40 people on a great Sunday. Like that would be a banner attendance day if they had 40 people. And yet on Wednesdays at lunch, they would serve about 150 people lunch. And they still, every, sun every Wednesday, 150 people. So they're telling me the story about that. And I said, well, how come you're not inviting these folks to church? And he said, well, you know, they don't want to come and do the worship the way we do it. And I'm like, I totally get that. Like, <laughs> we need to think about what, do we, what does it mean when we say we're welcoming and really mean it. But what I love about this congregation is that I found that there are these truth tellers who are able to say the things that we often feel like we're too polite or not wanting to say for fear of, um, you know, upsetting people. And so I said, well, maybe we should do something different to help this community feel more cohesive. 150 people on Wednesday, 25 on Sunday, and you're not in relationship, really. And a woman who works as a parole officer said, Bishop, you know, I, I just got to tell you, the, the, the truth of the matter is, is that we don't want these people in our church. And I just said, oh, my God. <laughs> because I'm looking at a group of people who are in a town that is really struggling and they are take they don't have tons of resources to share but they take what they share every week and share it with people who have less and they said this woman said we don't like the way they raise their children we don't like the way they smell we don't want these folks in our church and I said well if you can say that out loud to someone you just met in a room full of people you don't know then we can do something about that so that was the hopeful moment, and I tell, I reflect back with them at how that shifted what I thought of them as I was getting to know them, and it means that as I've gone back to be with them over the last two years, we're able to have really like deep conversations quickly. And so another conversation I had with another member of this parish had to do about racial reconciliation. We began to read as a whole diocese a book by Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas called. Um, 
stand your ground, black bodies and the justice of God. We read that as a whole diocese. And some people did it, some people didn't. But this congregation said, you know, we should go and invite the Baptist Church of Black Folks down the street to read this book with us. And there are no black people in this congregation, right? My picture is the only black person picture hanging in the whole space, right? That's, so that's a thing, right? And um, I said, you know, don't do that. Just don't, don't do that. And, you know, the, we were able to have an honest conversation about why. And the why was, like, if you can have this conversation as a congregation of all white people by yourself, in fact, please have that conversation all by yourselves, and then think about how you, as you process reading Dr. Brown's, Douglas's work, what that means for building relationships with people who you see every day but don't have a relationship with. So the hopeful thing for me is that if we're gonna make any real shift and change in the world, it means that we have to get real and we have to name the things that we have been too polite to talk about or to say, trusting that the relationship can hold it. Because if we can't tell the truth, we're just playing games and we don't have time to play games because people are dying. So that's the, that's the work. Well, it, you have a unique perspective, and diocesan bishops have a unique perspective because wherever we are in congregations, we can tend to get sort of in a bubble of, of our own community, and we tend to attract people who are sort of like whatever the identity is. You have a diocese that spans uh, urban, suburban, rural, that has um, some incredibly progressive sort of left-leaning uh, congregations, and you're also the state that elected Mike Pence governor. I mean, you have really, well, yeah. And so, it, well, you know, and so there's an opportunity here. Um, and I'm wondering, you see how the changes that are happening in our world don't just affect one social location, but multiple. I, I'd love to hear your perspective on what are the trends and things that you see most impacting people and the church in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Well, that's a big yeah, question. So, yeah, just, you know, a couple minutes. <laughs> you know, because it's quite a thing. Like, I, I go, I, we live now six blocks away from the governor's mansion, and so we drive by it daily. And it's a reminder of, you know, what Indiana is. And so the Episcopal Church, I have to just, for those of you who don't know Indiana, wherever you are in the Diocese of Indianapolis, you are in a bit of a bubble. You know, there's this way of thinking that, oh yeah, this is Indiana, except for when you come into an Episcopal church and you feel how broad and welcoming we are. And so, if I could just describe, it's, a, it's an interesting place to be because we are a place that has 100% clarity about being a welcoming and inclusive place. And it's stunning to me because I will go to a congregation in the middle of quote unquote, what I think of as like really off the beaten path, nowhere, but it's the place where you'll find, and you'll find transgender people in almost I mean, all of our congregations, but in places that I would least expect, not just the city, because people know that the Episcopal Church is the place where we mean it and we say all are welcome without exception. Now, that being said, we have people of all political stripes in our congregations. So um, there are people who love President Trump and pray for him daily, and there are people who are trying to have us be different politically, and they can come to the same altar every Sunday and be in community. And so um, when I think about what the, where the future of the church, where the world needs to go, is actually finding a way to, to share real space and relationship with that breadth of difference. And I don't, you know, the polar, fighting the polarization that's happening in our country means that it can't be done casually. Like if we're going to fight the tendency to stay in our own lane, in our own bubble, we actually have to get up every morning and say, how am I going to get out of this space and put myself in a different place today? And you know, I see signs of hope about that. I, I told Mike a story the other day about when I was a priest in Syracuse, New York, yeah. and um, we would have, uh, we had a lot of food justice ministries going on, and I was writing about food and farming and all this stuff on, as I was leading these, this congregation in the campus ministry, and there was a couple two retired folks from Syracuse University who would shop at Aldi's. And I would say, oh, Aldi's is kind of chaotic and I'd like to go to Wegmans. And there were sort of Wegmans people and there were Aldi's people <laughs> or price chopper people. And I just thought, what is that about? And what it was really about was this couple who could shop anywhere saying that, well, what's wrong with Aldi's? You know, and I thought, I, I, I grew up putting a quarter in the 
the, you know, to get my shopping cart. I don't want to do that anymore. And they were like, are you too good for the shopping cart? Like, what's up with that? And I just, you know, had to think about well, how do I locate myself, even as a black woman in leadership in this community where these white folks with resources to go anywhere were saying, I can put myself in this space where, and I can choose to do that and I should do that because I don't want to stay in the bubble with, you know, the Whole Food Wegmans crowd. And I think that's the, that's the thing is these daily choices that are so easy to avoid because of convenience and comfort that we're like, well, I shop here. Well, why don't we shop in these other places mm -hmm. where the people at the food pantry are shopping? It's the making these small decisions every day. And if we can begin to do that, then I think the future hope for the way we are in this country has the possibility of being shifted. And there are signs where people are becoming more conscious and making those choices. So I'm not sure if that really gets to your, your question, but yeah. I think it's, um, I desire to take the high level, instead of being up here with the theoretical, yeah. like it's about getting on the ground and waking up and saying, what is the choice I'm making with the basics, yeah. the, the foundational pieces? Because that's how we live our life. We're just trying to get through the day, most of us, right? Mm -hmm. Like we got a lot to do, we got a lot of people to care for, everyone's stressed within an inch of their life, and there are these little choices that can shift how we are in this world but it requires just a sort of on the ground consciousness about what we do with the little things. Yeah, and so that's great. And, and one of the things, I completely agree, and one of the things that we're finding as we're looking around is it takes greater and greater intentionality and effort to do that because part of the changing reality is as, say, as automation and artificial intelligence comes in and so many jobs in the service, I mean, there's an estimate that in the next 20 years, 30% um, of the jobs in America, and we're talking trucking jobs, service industry, they're going to be gone because they're all going to be done by robots, computers, whatever. So, you know, like it used to be that, you know, no matter what class I was, I wanted to buy a book, I'd go to a bookstore. And a bookstore is where I would meet lots of different people of different classes, and there'd be someone behind the counter that I'd meet with and talk to. I'd go to Romans. Um, now, more, you know, bookstores are disappearing. And we're resegregating, not just racially, we're resegregating by class because we don't need to interact with each other. And so, you know, the, the church is potentially a place that can be a place where everyone can come together, but there's gotta be an intentionality about that. Right, and the Episcopal Church has a classism problem. Yeah. It just does, and so, yeah. and I will say, I, I'm, I had to be convicted about this. My first cure was a church in upstate New York where um, the rector who was really, you know, we were really different night and day, but he would say, like, we have a class issue in this church. And I thought, huh, I don't, I don't know if I get that. And I, you know, I didn't know a lot. I thought I knew a lot. I was 31, new seminar, you know, new priest. But the, over the last 20 years, I've been thinking, oh, yeah, you know, we really like the kind of music we like. We like holding the prayer book and being very conscious about the literary illusions that we have, and like all of this, and I, you know, I went to Smith, I went to Cornell, I'm educated, I get it, and I think we're le we're, we say we welcome people, but we're just not willing to change those things that we love in order to have everyone feel like they can feel comfortable and welcome in our spaces. And we have to do, we have to figure out what it means to be able to have that broad welcome and mean it, and actually maintain our Anglican identity, which I think is possible, but we, ha we have to want to do that. We have to want to actually have people of diversity, of class, in our midst more than we love our high Anglican chant. And so what I do a lot of the time as I go around to congregations is to say, you know, our churches don't look like our neighborhoods a lot of the time. And that is not of the gospel. Yeah. <laughs> like we need to actually shift what we do because Holding on to our prayer book is not the most important thing. Holding on to Jesus is the most important thing. And we can use our prayer book and our liturgies as a way to do that. But if we're doing it in a way that keeps a whole bunch of people outside the door because they don't pray like us, then we're not doing the work of following Jesus. And so it's a hard, hard thing. So I want the church to be the place where we can mix. But that means we need to actually broaden what we think we're doing as the church. And... Um, yeah, so I have a lot to say about that. So we're trying to do a lot of things like yeah. trying to, you know, we've, we're doing a brave worship workshop in our diocese to help people understand that the Anglican Communion, the experience of worship on a typical Sunday across the Anglican Communion is really vast. And what we do on a Sunday in America is the minority experience. Mm -hmm. 
most people are they're drumming it up, they're dancing in the aisles, they are loose and free, with, not just necessarily in a Pentecostal way, but they're just fully embodied in their worship. And we don't all have to do it the same way, but I think we need to look and ask the question, are we actually providing the best witness that allows people, wherever they are, literate or not, to be able to enter into the worship of God? And we can do that, but we have to want it, and we have to have some skills to learn how to broaden the breadth of our musical experience, of our praying, and to get out of our heads and into our hearts a lot more deeply. Yeah, and so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And th this gets real for us. You know, Pasadena is changing. Um, Pasadena right now is 36 to 38 percent Latino Hispanic. The fastest growing population in this area uh, is Asian. The fastest growing among that is Chinese. Um, there is a substantial African-American population that is increasingly getting pushed out uh, and, and into north, you know, more, more deeply into northwest Pasadena and not allowed into other areas. Um, there's a lot of this stuff going on here. And so, you know, we have an opportunity, in addition to sort of generational things that are happening, um, one of my favorite stories in scripture is, is David and Goliath, and I love when uh, David tries on Saul's armor when he's supposed mm -hmm. to go to fight Goliath, and everyone thinks, oh my gosh, he gets to wear the king's armor, and this is wonderful, and what an honor to wear that, and it's worked for us for generations and generations, and David puts it on and says, this doesn't fit at all. Um, and he has to put aside something that everyone else is like, oh my God, that's precious. And he says, no, I just need five smooth stones. And, and so, so how do you, like when you go into congregations, and we all have our Saul's armor. Like how do you help congregations discern what Saul's armor is for them and what their five smooth stones might be? Ooh. Yeah. You know, I think... The way we, it's about asking, we're asking questions that are different now, you right. know, like what are the essentials? And so I think the question we're wrestling with now is like, why are we here? You know, the lot, Michael Curry, our presiding bishop, has convicted me, and I, I preached this around the diocese lately, that's saying that, you know, a lot of us come to church and we're not sure why we're there. Mm -hmm. Like we come because our grandparents brought us and we, it's what good Christians do. But unless we're actually wrestling with a story that we can tell about how Jesus changes our life and saves our life every day, then it makes it really hard to ask these deeper questions about what are the essentials to hold on to, right? And so we're trying to learn how to get in touch with that story, which may change over time, but everyone's got one, and we need to know how to tell it. And so I think it's, you know, what we're learning to do is to figure out why we bother to get up and to come to our church at all when so many people are making a different decision on a Sunday morning and um, sort of rooting ourselves in the faith in ways that are personal and yet also have implications for how we live as a body. And then the stuff that we might pile on, like you know the liturgy, which is important but not the thing, begins to have its right place of importance. It's not the thing. You know, it's, if you're only coming to church for the music, church will disappoint you eventually yeah. because you'll eventually go someplace where that music is not what's is not available to you and what do you have left and so it's the what is the essentials of your faith life that's keeping you when it gets really hard and different and if we can figure that out then we have a better way to discern what are the things that can easily be set aside now because they're not what's going to save us and the church is changing i mean you know the all the stuff we see right now even in a place like All Saints is wonderful, but it's going away. It just is, because this is never what it has been about. The big buildings and the, you know, we want the people, but the externals are not the essentials. And we need to figure out what are the essentials for us, whoever and wherever we are as a community of faith. Yeah, and I want, yeah, thank you. And I'm going to get back to that piece in a second. <laughs> um, you said something, and sort of these are like spoiler alerts for your sermon, but it's so worth it, like, <laughs> like do it. You talk about um, the ministry of mending, of mending people, of mending relationships. And when you talked about that, um, Becca Stevens, who's a friend of All Saints Church, um, and she talks about, oh, let her go. Um, and um, that it, she talks about there's really only one sacrament of the church with seven prisms, and that's healing. 
Um, and I love the presiding bishop talks about the way of love. And love lived in community and healing in community is the most powerful force um, in the universe. And so it, it, it seems to me that this is, like you talk about the essentials. Um, where do you see you know, the church, at, because it feels like we need love and healing as much as we've ever needed it before. Where do you see the church doing that, providing that, moving into that space? You know, I think I see it everywhere. I mean, yeah. honestly, you know, it's this, this is actually who we are, and we may not give ourselves enough credit for it because we call it, you know, outreach and these right. ministries. But I think the fact that we are, um, even on a day like today at All Saints, doing the presentation and bringing your bodies up and saying we're going to put our skin in the game and actually be here and contribute of our resources to make a difference, like those are the things that I think are signs of the healing because again, like you don't need to be here, right? You could be making really different choices and the, to the extent that people are still willing to invest in a communal thing where we're saying it's okay to be with people who are different and we're gonna actually give of our time and our resources to do that, that's a part of the healing work. Um, the healing happens in the conversations that we have that, get, that go wrong and end up in an argument and we continue to find our way back to each other you know, I, 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 I'm a big proponent of Fierce Conversations, which is a leadership tool, but I'm just telling talk, you. Talk a little about, the, the, about Fierce. So talk Fierce Conversations that. is a program out of Seattle, and it was used in corporate America. It still is. And the church, the Episcopal Church, finally started to dive into it. But basically, what it says is that the, the whole world can change one conversation at a time. No one single conversation can change the trajectory of a life or a career or a relationship, but any conversation can. And the way we build relationships is one conversation at a time. And the things that we don't talk about are the things that actually do more damage. And the premise is, is that you go into conversations assuming, expecting that the relationship will be stronger on the other side of it. Even if the conversation is hard and goes haywire and you walk away mad, you go into the conversation expecting that the relationship will be stronger and you come back even after the disruption. If you're thinking that the person you are encountering may be totally irreconcilable <laughs> to you and you have no hope of ever being in a relationship, well then you're never gonna have a possibility of a relationship, right? So mm -hmm. it's a, just a different way of thinking. So this is where the healing and the, the work of the church people who follow Jesus, I think, have possibilities. Like, we believe in relationships. We believe nothing is beyond redemption. But we actually have to really believe it all the time, which mm -hmm. means we enter conversations, even the difficult ones, really differently. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, I'm, not, I'm sort of going off no, topic a little great. bit, but that's the, the position of, of, of healing that I think we as a church ought to be proclaiming a lot more boldly. Like, we do believe in redemption. We believe that things can be healed and mended. But, you know, we've actually got to do it, too, and tell people and say it. Like, we believe this. Yeah. We don't believe that you can just walk away and never be in a relationship again. So let's try again. And it's hard, hard work to do it, which is, and we're busy and we're put upon and all these things. But we have the capacity to do that. Each and every one of us have the capacity for healing, relationships, conversations, any place where we see the tear or the fraying. We, we know how to do it. It reminds me of a Wendell Berry poem where the refrain, Amy McCreeth put this to a beautiful song, is what we need is here. Oh, yeah. What yeah. we need is here. And it just is, it's like, you know, everything that we need to do this work, we're, we're right here. And it's not the room. It's not this. It's we're right here in this room. Uh, you know, we, we are all we need to do this work. Um, and it's out there, too. It's the people who are out there that, you know, we need each other. Um, and I, I really think one of the gifts is these conversations are being really forced on us in a new way. Are we being invited into them? Um, so just sort of looking at economics and how things are changing, one of the things, and, and I want to I hear sort of what's your experience in Indiana. What, what we're experiencing here is there is a generation that has been and continues to be incredibly generous in financially supporting the church. Uh, it's the boomer generation, and it's moving, you know, people are moving into retirement. Um, and when they do, their income is getting less. Um, and these are people, you know, among us who um, they actually may be giving more proportionally, 
um, but the amount they're able to give, because their income is less, is going down. And then some of them um, are leaving their jobs and either realizing, well, we can't afford to live in Southern California anymore, or, hey, my kids and grandkids live somewhere else, and I really want to spend time with them, and so they move. And the new people coming in, you know, the younger people who are phenomenal, they have, you know, substantial debt load. Um, they do not have, you know, a lot of them are trapped in a rental economy, and so they have no way to build equity, to build up wealth, so they're worried about that. How are we going to pay for kids' college? Uh, and so, you know, every year, um, you know, it takes 14, 15, 20 new people to make up for one person who cuts their pledge. Um, and this is, you know, this is what we're facing. And, you know, the church is still healthy and vibrant. It's just, you know, we're, we're seeing a demographic shift happen um, that is forcing some conversations for us. And I want to, are you seeing the same thing in oh, Indiana? Okay. And sort of like, what, what conversations are you having as a diocese about this? It's Easy all questions over the for place. You. No, yeah. but I'll tell you. I mean, I, I remember from the profile for the search of a bishop for Indianapolis, there was a, um, a lot of conversational desires around race. You know, mm -hmm. so, you know, we, the one I always reflect back to them is that they had in their profile, we wonder when we gather at diocesan convention why we are so white. That was in their profile, and I thought... Who are these people? Oh. Like, yeah. I, you're asking that out loud? I'm all yeah. about it. Like, let's talk about it, right? So they elect me. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so, you know, I, so I get there and I'm like, okay, well, we can talk about race and for sure, these bravely, like, they're like, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about white supremacy dismantling and all of this stuff. Really amazing. But what I found out, though, the real one of the other conversations we needed to have was about money in class, and we talk about it all the time. And so we have enormous wealth disparities in Indiana. It shows up in the church. It shows up congregation by congregation. And so we have to name it and talk about how do we as a diocese create a community where everyone can actually find a place without shame yeah. to be a part of it so that we're not unconsciously saying to people, well, we welcome you, but not all of you, because you can't really afford to be here. <laughs> you can't afford to have a, you know, do church in the way we, we have done historically. You can't afford to come to this meeting because it's, it costs money. Every time I turn around, the issue of money and class and the disparities come up. And so we're having to talk about that in real time at the level of governance when we do our convention, like, there are implications because people want to participate and it's the class and money question which can be a barrier. So um, we have a long way to go in that conversation, but I just think we'll be more the church if we're actually naming it and then taking the, um, the blinders off because, you know, when you're in your bubble thinking, well, you know, this doesn't cost a lot of money or so of course we can do it or let's meet on this day. People aren't working on this day. Well, some people are working 24 hours a day, right. just trying to put the basics on the table. And so we have to know that because them, them is us, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And so rethinking our assumptions all the time and knowing that this is not, you know, in God's economy, like this is how it's supposed to work. The whole community is supposed to care for each other to make it possible to, to meet our needs. And it means that other tough choices will be made. So. We have congregations who can't afford to make it work with their building because they can't afford the building. And so they're leaving the building. Yeah. You know, we have a church in Speedway, which I'm so proud of because they made the decision over a year ago to leave their building, which was in a neighborhood that had great needs. It's one of the most diverse places in the whole state. People, new immigrants come to this community and so they need to be there. It is a mission critical place, mm -hmm. but they couldn't afford their building. So they left it. The building now has a lot of other groups using it to provide food, food and education, tutoring, all the resources that the community still needs. But the Episcopal Church is now worshiping in the clubhouse next to the, the racetrack. You know, Indy 500 is a real big thing in our <laughs> state, right? And so in the clubhouse for the golf community that's next to the, the track, they worship. So they're freed from the building and they are growing in number <laughs> because they're not spending all their time trying to figure out how to make the economics of the building work, but now they're able to actually help the economics of their community because they're meeting the needs of people in the neighborhood and they're spending their time on the mission. And I think that's where 
we're trying to say, you know, not everyone needs to have a big building. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are intimidated by our buildings anyway. You know, folks who haven't grown up in the church look at our buildings and they look like fortresses a lot of the time. And they're tucked away in neighborhoods people can't get to. So the future of the church for us is saying there are places where that will continue to be. We'll have the big buildings and the music programs and other places are gonna be fleet of foot on the ground in space that they might have to rent but they're doing the work of the church and following Jesus faithfully in that neighborhood. And that's the most important thing. So we have to get used to having a varied presence. Not mm -hmm. every Christian community in the Episcopal Church is gonna look the same, it never has. But if we can let go, again, getting back to the essentials and thinking about how do we care for everybody, no matter what their class status, what their economic status, as we kind of work alongside other people in our neighborhoods, Christian and not, to dismantle the systems that keep people poor. <laughs> you know, that's the other thing. Like, if we're not actually taking down the systems that perpetuate the way things are, we're not doing our work either. So we need to be freed up from the, the stuff in order to actually do that work. Yeah, I mean, this, this makes me think of so many things. We, uh, we do some work with a, a prison ministry here. Uh, Brother Dennis Gibbs and Community Divine Love here run an amazing ministry called PRISM. And um, you know, we baptized, uh, we call them, our, our, our siblings in exile and in incarceration mm -hmm. um, baptized uh, George, this amazing, amazing man. Um, and, you know, he, he came to faith behind bars. Yeah. And so that's what church looks like. There's a Methodist church in the downtown area. They sold their building and they now meet in a tent in the parking lot. Um, and, and they, uh, in fact, when Tracy Blackman was here to preach, they said, uh, okay, we're taking down the tent. We're all going to All Saints on Sunday. And they all showed up here. Um, and then just like across the street from the Weston here, there's a congregational church. They sold the building for like, I, I'm going to get it wrong, but several million dollars. And they've moved in with First United Methodist and, you know, Sandy oldwine has got a great church on Colorado, First United Methodist. And they've moved in there. And now they're saying, okay, so what do we do? We don't, we have, now we have this resource to use for mission and ministry. Um, and then it also reminds me, and please do not leave here and said the rector is going to sell the building. It's like, please, I know how things get. Yeah, no. no. First of all, I don't have the power to do that. Um, it's like, 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 don't leave there. I'm just giving examples. And the bishop who ordained me, uh, Hayes Rockwell, um, one of the many things that, that Hayes said that just lit, rit, rests on my heart is he said, churches that do not exist to serve the community should start paying taxes right now. Mm. Because that's why we, we don't have, a, we don't have, we're not tax exempt because the framers of the Constitution thought religion was great. It was because churches were seen as serving the community. Um, and so we have to be community centers, you know, even more than we are now. Right, Go. so um, we have a church um, that's the fastest growing church in our diocese. It's in a, we have, it's an interesting, two churches, one Anglo-Catholic and the other one the church plant growing like crazy because they're connected to the community deeply. But this church, I think Alfredo knows Gray Lassane, who's the rector at Good Samaritan. And Good Samaritan worships in a gym in a high school, and they're about to build a building in a place that's been land banked for the purposes of building a church. And they're saying, well, we don't need a church building, a sanctuary. We need a place to worship, but we need a place where the community can be served. And so they are trying to figure out how to build a building on this corner that where there's a lot, it's a huge intersection where people can get their needs met. And then they'll have a space where they can worship, but the primary use of that square footage is on community engagement and resourcing. And that's, I mean, that's the most beautiful thing. So they've got this church that serves, is their, that's their tagline. They are doing service every which way they can. And, you know, I love buildings. I just also need to say, yeah. I'm a historic preservationist by vocation. Yeah. I have a degree in how to restore church buildings. And they also, if they're not serving us, <laughs> we need to let them go. And that's good. There's a bit of a cliff coming for all of Christianity in this country, something yeah. that England experienced already on that. And, again, I think to the extent that they serve us, great. Yeah. But if they're getting in the way of us doing that life-transforming work that we're supposed to be doing following Jesus, then, you know, they become idols, and we, we, we can't hold on to them that well, way. And just find out, like, I came from a church, a phenomenal congregation in downtown St. Louis, uh, amazing people, amazing ministry, a building with two to three million dollars of deferred maintenance, a congregation that couldn't support the financially. They can support ministry, um, amazing ministry, and it just is the reality is the building's dragging it under. 
And, and like I look at what we're, you know, we're, we're starting something here we've started called PACES, which is a, a planned phased redevelopment of campus. And part of what we're looking at is not just how do we serve the needs of this changing community at All Saints, but what does it mean to really serve the community? How do we develop our campus um, in a way that we become even more indispensable to Pasadena and the region? And people are like, you know, maybe they don't want to come to worship here, but they're going to meet love here um, in a transformative way. And it's like you saw the playground that we have. And our dream for that playground is that you know, parents who have to take their kids to court at the courthouse will come over and use it. Yeah. Um, and so how do, you know, how do we do that work? Um, I'd love for us to be in continuing conversation because I'm sure there's models for what you're seeing, not just in Indianapolis, but around the church as you travel around, that we have a, you know, we have a lot to learn. Yeah. So I'd love to yeah. continue to be in conversation about that. And, and recognizing, as you said, place is important. Um, and so, you know, the places that we do have, we need to figure out a way to preserve them for everyone and do it well. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, no, there, there's a lot to be, you know, just rethinking our assets in a way that puts the other and those who are, you know, the Episcopal Church, I think, almost everywhere has the ability to kind of push above its weight because we do have these assets. And so we, no matter what our size is, can affect exponentially more people, but we've got to be thinking of it that way. You know, Congre I saw something on Facebook about churches that have their doors locked all the time, which is a hard thing, you know? It's like, how do you even get into some of our spaces? We want to be welcoming, but we, we wrestle with security and yeah. all of these things, and yet, these are assets that can be used for the whole. So the issue is, how do you hold on to the building, but get outside the building to get into the, the, on the street, on the, in the schools again, and to yeah. say, what do you need? What is it that we can offer to help you? We don't, we don't need to tell you what you need. We need to hear what you need and to ask that question by not saying, come inside here and tell us, but again, to get out in those spaces and then respond and have it as a continual conversation to not say that we've asked the question, got an answer, and now we're done. It's a continual conversation as our neighborhoods shift, as our memberships shift, all of those things. Yeah. And then to say, as the Episcopal Church is now beginning to do, Let's ask not exactly, not only who is in our churches on Sunday morning, what's our average Sunday attendance, but what is our average weekly participation? What does it mean to be a member? The idea that we're saying that we have members who come on Sunday, but the thousands of people who might come to All Saints the rest of the week aren't part of this community, that's crazy. So we have to change our language. Like your, your reach is broad and it's okay, it's probably even really important to claim that, you mm -hmm. know? And, but we start by acknowledging that we have a resource in these buildings, but getting outside of them and being outside of them more than we're actually in them. Yeah. So yeah, lots to talk about, lots yeah. to do. So we got w like one minute. What do you want to leave us with? Oh. If you have a message for all saints, what do you want to leave us with? Oh, I'm not prepared for that one. I would say, you know, um, yeah, you, this is, you, you know, the fact that you're such a church of impact in this part of this, the country, in, in, this, in the Episcopal Church, like every opportunity you have to help lead in this work, you know, and with all the demographics you're talking about, I just think there's a, you've been a learning, a place of learning for a lot of the church. Like what would it be like for you to be really leading in that way of following the revolutionary Jesus and um, raising it to the level of importance that the other things that you might be known for. You know, you stream the forum, you stream the services, people love, inc incredible choirs. But to flip the script and to be known as the church that ch helped change Pasadena, mm. <laughs> right? Because you are so embedded in the lives of people who may not worship here because that's your main work. I think you can do it, I know you can do it. You just have to decide. Like, and that's the word for all of us in the Episcopal Church. We just have to decide that that is the work and it's more important than the other things. As a bishop, I say that my job right now in the church is to do all the things bishops are supposed to do, but to hold the institution together enough to, because the institution is not the thing. Yeah. Denominations are provisional, Michael Curry says. Like this is just yeah. the stuff that is gotta be enough of a structure to hold us to do the real important work of transforming the world. So we don't need to be spending as much time on keeping the structure intact. We need to be just enough 
so that we can do the transformational work. And you all saints can do it. Mm -hmm. You just have to decide. Amen. Thank Bishop you. Jennifer Baskerville Burroughs.